There was nothing left. Every fence on the place, cattle yards, tractors, implements, silage, hay and cattle, sheds, the house, a lot of old cars have been collecting for a lot of years, a lot of old Fords, um, they're all gone. Australia's black summer bushfires destroyed homes, properties and lives across the country. Can we go your way about this much? Months on, some are still without running water or a warm place to sleep. A caravan's a very hard place to be. There's not much you can do. We go to bed as soon as it's dark. We get up as soon as it's light. Does it surprise you that all these months on, people's basic needs are still not being met? Oh, heavens, yes. Yes, it's very, very surprising and, and dismaying. Locals are relying on each other for help. Thank you. I come bearing you. Bring her of goods all the time. Can't you stop? She never no. stops. Bushfire recovery is a deeply complex and gruelling process. For many people, asking for help has been hard and it hasn't come fast enough. Tonight on Four Corners, we've come here to southeast New South Wales, where one community is pulling together to find a way forward after one of the worst disasters in living memory. This morning we had a delivery of 207 1,000 litre water tanks which are going to be distributed throughout the Shire. People have been coming in all day, picking them up on their trailers and um, yeah, it's been pretty busy today. For months, hundreds of people in and around Cabargo have been living without access to one of life's most basic necessities, water. This donation of 207 tanks is a huge relief. People are using bottled water or they're bringing in 20 litre containers of water to fill up here at the showground. And that's all the water they've got because their whole water infrastructure has been burnt. Their, their tanks have melted or their concrete tanks, the water in them has been compromised. So they have no water. Chris Walters, who runs the local relief centre, has the hard task of working out who needs one of these tanks the most. We need some official documentation. So that no fences, you are. no high sheds. But that's not, I need a document. Did you get an insurance payout? Yes, I did. Okay, so if you can send to me mm. your drugs licence and that insurance letter mm. overnight, yeah. or later today, whatever, um, I'll put you on the list, mm. and then if we have a spare, yeah. you're ready to go. OK. This tank will mean everything to Kath Healy and Rachel Hatton, who've been living in a caravan with no running water since losing their house in the fire on New Year's Eve. Oh, you all stay there. Tomorrow with this, like, the stress is off just that little bit more. We can have a shower, we can wash up, and we don't have to stress. It's one little thing. It's a big thing in our day. A huge big thing, it really is. What have you been doing uh, for the last five months? Uh, existing, <laughs> literally existing, because day to day is just so hard. If you get up in the morning and it's four degrees, like, it's bloody cold. So you've got to get water, you've got to feed the animals, you've got to try and keep warm. And it's just, yeah, it's ridiculous. 
I don't know how. I don't know how we do it, honestly. Oh, I don't even know what to start. Clothes, jackets. Kath and Rachel are still in need of simple things like blankets and warm clothes. The relief centre has become a lifeline. That looks nice. Short sleeve. Yes. Short sleeve. Oh, and they fit. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I think they oh, might yeah. make the ankles cool. That looks warm. Yeah, yeah. Nice and warm. That's a good one. Danielle Murphy runs the centre alongside Chris Walters. They're both volunteers. Is that them coming in now? Because I don't know. We provide a bit of a gathering place for people who come in looking for assistance and for material help. Um, but also, it, it helps with their mental health, I think, that people can still feel part of the community, even though, particularly in coronavirus times, they're feeling very isolated. Oh, come on, this is like frozen. Danielle is a punk rocker who made the tree change from inner city Sydney to Cabago 16 years ago. She's now a key part of the bushfire relief effort. Danielle, uh, we heard the generators would be coming. Um, they're for small businesses that's and, us. yeah, primary, so that's primary producers. Primary producers that's, small that's, that's my Chris, project. That's yeah. her project you need yeah. to speak with Chris about. Yeah. Well, just wake up my computer and put you straight on the list. Yeah. Terrific. Thank we, you we very much. We try to wear different hats, otherwise... We've got to split the projects, otherwise we'd both go mad. <laughs> Danielle and I had never met before the first week of January. We live in the same town, but we're quite different ages. We have different interests and so forth. And it just grew. It just grew out of necessity, out of just sort of... We were the last men standing when the other um, volunteers all had to go off to their other lives after the first influx of people and volunteers when the bushfires first happened. We're like two heads, one brain. It's a lovely little tag team we've got going. Um, and so, you know, we call between ourselves, you know, Chris is the uh, efficiency department. You know, she, she will be, you know, whereas I'm a little bit more chaotic. I think together we combine to, you know, become this really successful working team. And what are we only allowed? One, is one. it? Or one, yep. one per family, like yep. that? Yep, yep. Well, that, well, that's very good because I've got... Um, um, Three two litre water bottles to cook it. I fill up now. Yeah, I go yeah. after I go go for a shower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without sounding soppy about it, we want to help people. We do want to help people, but we we really feel it's important that we stay the distance to help people because we've developed relationships with people, and they can come in and they know that they're talking to a friendly face and someone that they've probably seen before, and so we're here for the long haul. These are people who've worked for everything that they that they have had um, and haven't had to ask for, for help before. They're very independent, resilient people and, you know, hard-working Australians. So, and, they've, and up until now have been fine on their own and, and building what they've built, as, as we all do throughout our life. But then to have it all taken from you in the, you know, blink of an eye, um, yeah, it's, it's quite reducing, I guess, to, to how a person feels about themselves. We are headed to Call of the Light to go and see Stefan. Um, I will be taking out some a few supplies to Stefan and a food hamper from Food Bank. And a few extra little goodies, which I like to do for Stefan. He's a beautiful man has a big rebuild ahead of him. Daniel! I come bearing you. Bring her of goods all the time. Can't you stop? She never no, stops. No, because these are your soul she, things. She's my... Your soul things. My Santa. I have a... Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm a marsupial now. And... You're starting to spoil me. I got more. I'm going to go get it. Here we go, something. 
something oh, living no. and green. Mm. And bought its food. It's essential. Taka. But it's, uh, but it's a Good food. Good taka. Hunter. Yeah, that's what we need. Stefan Talmatsky is a homeopath who moved from Germany to Australia 40 years ago. The mud brick home he built by hand was destroyed in the fires. It's war, like war was here. Look like Donetsk or Syria or, or the Allied bombings of Germany, the pictures I know, you know. Indescribable, actually. And sad, of course, sad. He's been given two weathered caravans and a shipping container to see him through the winter. Like many in the area, he was uninsured. He's been given $50,000 from the Red Cross to rebuild and $8,000 from the state government to replace his appliances. Have you found it hard to ask for help? Yeah, I never. That was actually one thing yeah, I learned through this. I, 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 I was always reluctant to do this. And now I've become a hunter and gatherer. I grab everything. I mean, Daniel and Chris, they help me. Yeah, but I've literally asked for some things. That was hard, but not terribly hard, you know? I could combine it with a certain necessity. <laughs> Hmm. It's come up once you... For uninsured people, it's, you know, overwhelming and when they're being given these grants and, you know, they're trying to hang on to every last cent. You know, they're trying not to spend it because they know that that is the one and only opportunity that they have to rebuild it and a lot of those times they will never, ever get it back to a level that it was. And... Yeah, my heart goes out to them. When Ronnie and Trevor Eagles fled their nearby property in Upper Brogo, they had to leave everything behind. And as we were leaving, all I could hear was the cry of animals and the cry of the... the pigs. Um, that was really sad. They sound like children, which is not really pleasant. Uh, I couldn't do anything, I couldn't save them. They bought this farm with Trevor's superannuation six years ago. Their plan was to earn enough from the farm to see them through retirement. Oh, well, I've that. Basically, all my superannuation that I put into the place, I've lost, I've lost everything. And apart from a few little bits and pieces you see around that, if it wasn't for mates or people coming down, we'd have nothing. All the tractors, there's, there's two tractors, and it's gone. It's, all the machinery's basically gone. The sheds are gone. What else you got left? Each day is a struggle. They own a house near Sydney but need to stay on the farm to look after the animals that survived the fire. Oh, well, my day starts by getting around about up at about 7 o'clock. I go feed the animals first before I feed ourselves. Well, they, they can't feed themselves. I feed the pigs first, then I feed the dogs and the cats. I go down, I do the sheep, and my husband does the cattle. In winter, the temperature can drop below zero. 
They weren't insured. The only shelter they have is a caravan loaned by a neighbour. So the front down, get the other one up there before the wind blows away. He let us have the caravan to use and I am so grateful to him for that. My son's up the top there and he's trying to put these tarps on so it doesn't get wet in there, otherwise I just get the, you know, the chairs will get wet and you don't want the slippery floor because then if you fall over, you've had it. A caravan's a very hard place to be. Um, you ain't got much, there's not much you can do. We go to bed as soon as it's dark. We get up as soon as it's light. I've got the little cooktop. Um, but I also, I've been able to make cakes in a Weber now. I haven't been able to do that before. <laughs> they always burnt the bottom. Now I figured out how to do it. I put a tray underneath as well, and then I put the cake on top of that, and they come up really good. <laughs> so the Weber helps. With no running water, they head into Cabago a few times a week for a shower in the public bathrooms. We can't do it every day. It's just too far and it's too much on petrol to have a shower. I've been washing um, myself with wet ones. Uh, if I have to go out somewhere quickly, I just give my body a, a wash over. So it's not the best. I miss, uh, I miss a proper shower. I did dig the old fashioned um, toilet, which, huh, it serves its purpose. I can put a tree in it afterwards and close it on in, and I'll have a good tree then. <laughs> uh, so other than that, yeah. Making do. Mate do, yeah, mate do. How are you going to pay for the rebuild? Well, that's a debatable question. I just don't know. Whether some of the grants that was on the plate and some that we didn't get, and they would have made a big difference too, but, you know, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, they say you weren't eligible, you're not eligible, you know. That's where it goes. Me, myself, I've had a lot of cries and I've had a lot of... Um, I, I, I talk to people, whereas it's harder for a man, it's harder for him being used like used to being the man who is a breadwinner and being reduced to feeling like he's nothing is really hard. He'll put on a really good front, uh, say, oh, yeah, everything's fine, you know, normal manly thing. But when your manhood's taken from you where you can't, you're stuck. Um, and... What are you supposed to do? And I can't help him. That's what hurts me more. Fire roared through Cabago on New Year's Eve. Two days later, Prime Minister Scott Morrison came to see the devastation. Brian Arlick, we met over the road, we've done 48 years. That was a family business there, gone. Bangles Gallery, up here, that's where uh, those, those are house, house ages we were talking about earlier, gone. You have a smile. Looking in this direction. Good on you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good on you. The former mayor, local dairy farmer Tony Allen, showed the PM around the relief centre where bushfire victims had set up camp. I was made aware that the Prime Minister was coming and I, uh, I thought, well, uh, this could be good for us because we needed help. We needed help from whoever we could get help from. We were, we were, we were smashed. The visit turned into one of the most politically charged moments of the summer. Uh, good. How are you? I'm only shaking your hand if you give more funding to our RSS. So many people here have lost their homes. We need some vets. We don't have enough vets. We need more help. To see somebody just come to one of the most devastated areas, bring nothing with them at the time as well. And the very first moment I saw him, he was turning his back on a friend of mine who, you know, was pregnant, 
uh, has a small child, lost everything. And so that's when I, you know, I snapped. We had four trucks to defend our town because our town doesn't have a lot of money, but we have hearts of gold, Mr. Prime Minister. I was exhausted, I hadn't slept, I'd fought fires, I still had ash all through my hair, bits of melted plastic. Um, so it was just a reaction to immediately, you know, what, what I was seeing happen in front of me. And, and it was just this, you know, sense of outrage that the little people are, are very much overlooked in, in any disaster. It's, um, yeah, I was, I was enraged. I didn't just, just didn't read the emotion that was here. My intention was to have him come and meet the, the great people who had started the little relief centre we had at Cabago and also meet with some of the people who had lost so much. And sure, they, they were going to be most, but I didn't for one second think it was going to turn into a, into a bloody circus, basically. It's really rude, mate. It really now, is. Mate. Nah, you're an idiot, mate. Oh. You really are. Where are we getting any boats down here, buddy? Yeah. 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 Who wants liberal round here? Nobody. No liberal boats. You're out, son. You are out. You're the yeah. 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 Bye. 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 I think that um, it was. Unfortunate, um, something I regret having been part of. But in, in, in hindsight, what did what did you do? You you think you're doing the right thing by your community. Now, you know we've, we've moved forward as a community. The people involved have uh, been very very helpful in helping us up at the uh, relief centre. And uh, um, but I think the scars, the, 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 the scar of that prime minister being treated that way is is not a good look. There are some people who at first were angry at my outburst, now see how hard I work and realise that it was never, you know, it was never my intention to, you know, just stage a personal pro protest or get on television or anything like that. It was, um, yeah, just a frustration for people's needs not being met or listened to. All I can do is... You know, that a lot of my motivation for working so hard for people still is to show people that, you know, it was never my intention to bring bad publicity for Cabago and it was never a preconceived uh, act of what I did that day. Six months on from the Prime Minister's visit, the devastation still stretches for hundreds of kilometres around Cabago. While billions have been pledged for bushfire recovery, a common feeling here is that the response from big charities, government and politicians hasn't been good enough. If it's Scott Morrison come down, we had Michael McCormack, the, the, you know, the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Cabinet Ministers, Senators, all sorts of people come down here, all sorts of po politicians of different, both both political stripes and have seen the area, you know, seen the area, seen the damages down here and they've seen it and just haven't responded because I keep saying that it, it was such a, the scale of this is huge and the response to that has got to be huge as well and I just don't think it has been. Dave Allen runs the only pub in town. How are you, Dad? What's up, John? No, I don't much to tell. It was his dad, Tony Allen, who showed the PM around the relief centre. Yeah, I suppose he's working, mate, not bloody laying about. Dave yeah. saved the hotel from the fire as it tore through the shops nearby. He's still traumatised. The first few weeks, I didn't get a lot of sleep. Um, you'd start crying. Um, you know, all of a sudden you start crying. Um, but that, you know, you gradually work your way through that and then get, and getting back to work was important for me and getting something to do and, and not focusing on what happened and focusing on what we can do to 
you know, move forward and, and get the place going again, so that helped. But the people who didn't have a, a job to go to or had lost their homes, just lost their sense of being, so to speak, I guess it was really, really tough. He talks to bushfire victims every day and is shocked at the conditions some are still living in. Still got a lady who was coming here getting meals. She was sleeping in her car. She had a caravan, but she couldn't sleep in the caravan because she had a back complaint, so she had to sleep in her car every night. You know, people still um, you know, have to go outside at two degrees outside to go to the toilet from in these old caravans. and. I just don't understand with all the money that was donated um, through various charities, all the, the government assistance that five months, almost five months down the track, there's people still living rough and, you know, we're, we're in winter now. When you've got people living in tents and caravans in the middle of winter, there's going to be more people just virtually give up because they don't, they don't, they don't have any hope. Um, and this could go on for years. I think because the disaster was so huge that the government bodies and agencies who would have stepped up and have tried to step up, have just not been equipped. They were never equipped to deal with such an enormous disaster. And I also think that grants and that sort of thing, the applications are just almost impossible for people who are suffering severe trauma to fill out. Uh, it's, none of those forms are simple. And there's a lot of, oh, it's just too hard, I'll give up. I just can't do this. There's a lot of that happening or has happened. Um, so I think that all these months on, finally the agencies, and I, I'm not just going to say the government agencies, but all the agencies, Red Cross, Salvation Army, all those people who normally would help in a disaster, they're catching up now. On Jade Corby's farm in Wandella, north of Cabago, the cleanup is finally getting started. State and federal governments are paying contractors to clear people's blocks. How you going? Good. So? Good. I'm Monica. We've talked on the phone. Yep. Uh, yep. This is Dax. How's it going? Good. Jade is showing the assessors um, through what remains so of his home. That's the house just here. Yep. And just up behind that was the old dairy. Uh, yep. It's just a shed these days. OK. Yeah. There was nothing left. Every fence on the place, um, cattle yards, uh, tractors, implements, um, silage, hay and cattle, sheds, the house. Um, a lot of old cars have been collecting for a lot of years, a lot of old Fords. Um, they're all gone. Just a quick one to start with. Um, Do you have asbestos? Is it an asbestos site? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So this, that's what will be the asbestos there. In this shire alone, there are more than 2,000 burnt buildings to remove including an enormous 32,000 tonnes of material contaminated with asbestos. We're saying about four weeks, mm -hmm. given this has the asbestos, it's probably yeah. the, the, the latter end of that four-week yeah. mark, rather than being able to slot it in earlier, Yeah, yeah. I reckon. Yeah. Yeah. Jade is also helping at his parents' place on the next ridge over. His family has been farming in the area for four generations. This is Mum and Dad's house. This is where we were brought up. Mum and Dad built this themselves uh, with a builder, just the three of them. Um, I think I might have been about three or four or something like that, yeah. So um, it was a five-bedroom five -bedroom house. There was seven of us kids, so... Yeah, yours. <laughs> Five of Jade's family also lost their homes in the fire. Just over the hill there is my sister's place. My place at the next ridge just through there. We all lost our place. Um, got an auntie on the next ridge over sort of just to the side here, another auntie up behind me. Um, yeah, so there was 
five of us. Five of us lost homes out here, and then my pop lost his house in town. Yeah. So six houses in one family. Yeah, yeah. So, Incredible. But yeah, we're all still here, so yeah. He's tagging what he thinks he can salvage. The rest will be sold for scrap metal or end up in the tip. This tractor of yours, are you done with it? Did you want it to go into the scrap or? Yeah, you're finished with it? Righto. It's good, it's one step closer. Um, makes you feel a bit better, but at the same time, it's, it's also a bit emotional too when, it's, when they're starting to tear stuff up and you know, there's not much left anyway, but um, it's, it's a positive, um, yeah, looking at the future. Yeah, looking forward. It's an early start for these volunteers who've set up camp at the Cabago Sports Ground. They're mostly backpackers, donating their time through the charity Blaze Aid, which helps rural communities rebuild fences and infrastructure after a disaster. People just want to help because the devastation in Kabako is huge. There's a, a lot of properties that need help. We've got um, 513 registered properties here. Um, so there's, it's a big job. Today, a Blaze Aid crew is helping Warren Salway on his cattle farm. He estimates he's lost $260,000 worth of fences in the fires. Right so we've got all the insulators off. Yeah. The, the top one, oh. the top insulator can go to the top of the post. Uh, so just one electric on the top? One electric on the top and then there'll be a barb and then three planes and the hinge joint. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. Yay, yeah. Ah, he said I'm, I'm I was a bit hesitant hard. about getting blaze aid, to be honest with you, and a lot of farmers are probably the same. They think, oh, you know, are they going to slow us down? What are they going to do? What are they going to be like? And I can tell you it was one of the best things I've ever done. Um, they're terrific people. Like, they're young people travelling, but they can tie off, they can run wires, they can put steels in. The time they've saved me, these kids have been absolutely terrific sort of things. Yeah, put them all back in the bag and then we've got them. OK. Right Perfect. Just put a new one on. Take this. If you had have said to me I would have two solicitors, a school teacher and an actor here working with me, I would have laughed at you six months ago. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't say enough for them. They are just so good of people. Even with this help, Warren Salway has years of work ahead of him to rebuild his farm. It's not just the fences. He lost two houses, five sheds, the stockyards, and 150 cattle. We lost in excess of $1.3 million um, in, in infrastructure on the farm. Uh, the cattle weren't insured, the fences weren't insured, uh, one house wasn't insured, and um, three of the five sheds weren't insured. So, yeah, we, we copped it. But people say to you, why didn't you have it insured? 
you can't afford to insure everything you've got. Like your premiums are so much, you, you know, you draw a line somewhere. Warren lost a lot more than his property in the fire. His brother Robert and nephew Patrick were killed defending their farm. They got caught. They were in a paddock like this, only 30 metres from the house. You know, like, it shouldn't have happened, but they got hit by a fireball. And, you know, I didn't experience a fireball here. I had plenty of fire, but I didn't have a fireball. Up at our other farm, there was, just the way the trees have been tore apart sort of thing. But, um, yeah, no, that was yeah, pretty hard to deal with. But, but, you know, you've just got to move on, haven't you? Like, what do you do? Jade Corby was a friend of the men who died. I'm so sorry about the loss of Robert and Patrick Salway. What impact has, has that had on the community here? I don't want to comment on that one. In all, four people died from the fires around Cabargo. The tiny village of Korma, just 10 minutes up the road from Cabargo, was nearly wiped out. The fire swept through the Quorma village and pretty much came in five directions. If you look around the mountain ranges here, everything's just scarred. It's just sticks. Apart from the people that didn't lose their houses, 80%, I would say, of our population have lost something, whether it's their home, their shed, their vehicles, their stock. Everybody's lost something. I think we've lost our innocence as well. I think we've lost our, oh, she'll be okay, mate, because it's not, and it won't ever be. <laughs> Ellie and Andrew Newton moved to Corma two years ago when they bought the general store. You guys, you never went through this, though, did you? No, that's what I mean. I don't envy it. So we've become like the hub, we've become like the councillors, we've become the huggers up until COVID-19, we've become, I'm so sorry, would you like a glass of water or can I help you? We've become the eyes and ears of our community. What are some of the struggles that the people that you're seeing coming to your shop every day are still having because of this bushfire? Okay, so we've got mental health issues, um, that's pretty major. We've got people who've lost their sense of purpose because they maybe have lost their business, lost their house, or just lost everything. Next to the general store is Cormer's Bushfire Relief Centre. Inside is a wall of post-it notes from locals that appeared in the days after the fires to let others know they were safe. The word recovery just, um, we're nowhere near that yet. We're still, still cleaning up and just repairing the damage that the, the, the initial damage that the fire did so that we can then get on to some stage that leads up to eventually um, being able to think about recovering from the event. Veronica Abbott has been running the centre since it started, helping people navigate the bureaucratic maze of grants and loans and find basic supplies. Now this in a bag. Oh. Oh, thank and it's you. got some money in it. Oh, really? It just randomly turned up and I thought maybe it was meant for Polly. Well, I brought some bags of clothes in yesterday okay. from Polly. 
that were given to her that didn't fit. That's probably... Oh, yeah. thank you. She'd be very happy about that. <laughs> She's worried about the community's mental health. We had a, um, a suicide of a person who um, is in the broader community who was um, fire affected. So many people have gone through things in different ways and, and for a lot of people the, um, the, the bad time quite possibly hasn't hit yet because we've been going through this, this, this early days of um, there's so many things that you need to do and so um, we haven't really had until probably more recently time to sit and even think about what's actually happened. There has been councillors here uh, during the, uh, over the bushfire period and so on, but those people have moved on. I think probably after, after the dust settles, that's when you do need a bit of um, mental health assistance. Probably uh, they need to probably come back and have a, another look. All I can suggest to people is if they feel, they, they feel that they're, um, uh, they can't handle it, they should talk to somebody. You've got to talk to people. If you don't talk to people and you bottle it up inside, then the worst can happen. It took months for the burnt out remains of the Cabago main street to be cleared. It was one of the most visible scars on the landscape. Now, people here can begin to move forward. Well, it's important because you're not going to have to walk past it every day and be reminded of, um, you know, what, what's happened. And that's not to say that people are going to forget, oh, it's not there anymore, oh, what fire, you know. People will always remember, but it was just this psychologically, you know, psychological um, visual of, of the loss. Out of the ashes, a stronger community is emerging. That's a single bed, that one. Despite her own struggles, Ronnie Eagles is volunteering at the Cabago Relief Centre two days a week. It's my way of giving back to Cabago and my way of saying thank you for everything that you've been doing for us. Not just me either, it's other people in the area. And it's nice to be able to meet them as well. Even a couple that were on our road, which we didn't even know were along that road. And they came in and their little girl was having a two-year-old birthday. I shoved a couple extra things in for her, you know, I gave her a couple extra teddy bears and, you know, made a little smile on her face, hopefully, and yeah. Over the past six months, people here have been quietly rebuilding their lives, firmly focused on the future. How long do you think it's going to take for you to get back on your feet? Get uh, back to normal? It's, you know, a couple of years and I probably should have everything back to, you know, some, somewhere near it. How are you feeling about that when you think about what you've got ahead of you? I, I try not to think about it too much, you just sort of just keep working and keep going and just keep busy, yeah. A lot of people have, at the beginning, not been forthcoming with asking for help, but we find now that they're actually coming through and saying, actually, I'm not OK and I, I do need a bit of help, so... And we try to do that in, in a way that, you know, um, preserves a person's dignity uh, because, you know, that's a person's pride and their dignity should be something they should always be able to retain. Don't forget about us. We're still struggling. It's going to take a very, very, very long time for the bushfire affected people and countryside and villages and economies to recover if in fact some of them ever do. Um, and yeah, just be with us, work with us, stay with us. <laughs>